You know, as those kids scamper out each and every week, I'm reminded of why Jesus, when he's talking about faith, he says, you know, unless we can have the faith like one of these, one of these little children, then we can't enter the kingdom of God. I love our kids. We love your kids. We love our children here at Blackhawk. And I just want to say welcome if you're here. I know I've met several first-time guests that have decided to come join us today. We don't take that lightly. Thank you for being here. Welcome to just being a part of the Blackhawk family. We already consider you family. And then we also have an extended family that goes far beyond what you see in this beautiful facility God's giving us. So some of you are watching us online at home, in your PJs, whatever that looks like on television. Thank you for tuning in as well. We hope that today is a blessing to you. I want to continue to talk about bold faith in uncertain times. Bold faith in uncertain times. You've got your Bibles. Look at 2 Kings with me. We're going to be there all day today. 2 Kings, we're going to be over in chapter number 5, the first 14 verses. And so we're going to do things a little bit different. I want to share, kind of lead into this story about this character named Naaman that we're going to look at today. And then we're going to hear a real life story from one of our own family here at Blackhawk. And then we're going to sing something. And then I'm going to come back and finish out our message today. But Naaman, today we're going to look at this idea of bold obedience. Bold obedience. So far in this series, we started with the story of Elisha. That's what we're doing. We're journeying through the life and ministry and leadership of Elisha. Elisha lived in uncertain times. And as we see those uncertain times unfold around him, the interesting thing is in the middle of all of the uncertainty comes this bold faith that I believe and I know God wants to bring out in my life and in yours, even when we are in the middle of uncertain times, just like Elisha. We looked at his bold commitment. We've looked at his bold trust. We've looked at, even last week, bold provision and how it's our emptiness. And there's a little bit of a theme there in Elisha's life and in those that Elisha ministers to. Is it takes an emptying of us for us to get to this place where we can be filled with the bold faith that God has intended for our lives. And so here's what we're looking at. The statement that kind of has driven this series is really that we often ask God to do bold miracles through our faith, yet at times we'll refuse to put ourselves in a position to need the very miracles that we beg God for. God, do something new in my life. God, stretch me. God, grow me. God, help me to be a person of faith that touches those around me, but don't ask me to get uncomfortable. Don't ask me to let go of this thing, or don't ask me to revisit that relationship, or don't ask me to do something that would, you know, cause any pain in my life, because that, that wouldn't go with faith, or would it? And we've looked at how when we put ourselves in the position for God to do those kind of miracles, that's the playground. That's the foundation. That's where it all happens, where God will stretch and grow your faith. Now, Naaman, everybody say Naaman. Naaman, henceforth, I think I'll refer to Naaman as Captain Awesome. Everybody say Captain Awesome. Awesome. Because that's really who we're looking at. Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5 is a hero. He's known for his courage, for his country. He has even been led. uh, God used him to lead troops to victory, to battle, to win this huge victory for his country. And so he is awesome. He's Captain Naaman, Captain of the Army, but he's Captain Awesome because God even used somebody like him to do some big things. And so he's highly revered, highly respected. He has got it all together. Have you ever met a Captain Awesome before? You can say yes. It's all right. I've met a few. Sometimes I've met Captain Awesomes that... I don't think they're that awesome. You ever met them too? Well, Naaman really was a pretty awesome guy. God had done some really amazing things in his life. But here's the thing. He has two problems. In verses 1 through 8, I'm kind of giving you the snapshot of what sets up our story for the day. And in verses 1 through 8, we see he has two, what I'll say, two major problems. Number one is an obvious problem. Number two is a problem that he's oblivious to at the time. So an obvious problem and an oblivious problem, if you will. The obvious problem is that Naaman, even though he's Captain Awesome, even though he has won these battles and everybody looks up to and respects him, he has leprosy. Now, leprosy is a term that, was, that really referred to just a lot of different skin diseases during that time, but it never was pretty. 
It was a hideous disease that would really cause people to stay away from you. It was repulsive. You had to stay on this end of town, and everybody else had to stay around from you. You had to announce yourself to keep distance from other people so you don't spread skin diseases. So he has that obvious problem of leprosy, but he has a problem that he's a little bit oblivious to, and that is a pride issue on the inside. He has come to realize that he is Captain Awesome, and he sees himself in the mirror, and He understands how awesome he is, and sometimes that can be the root of all kinds of other issues. He's going to learn that through this story. But what happens is he gets sent by his king to the king of Israel because, hey, there's that prophet. This little little maid said, hey, there's a prophet in Israel. He should go, Naaman should go see him. He's healed a lot of people. He should step out in faith and go out there. And so his king sends him to the king of Israel says, and writes the king a letter and says, heal this guy. And the king of Israel, kind of like we see throughout these stories, said, well, who does he think he is? Is he trying to pick a fight with me? Does he think I can kill people and bring them back to life? Does he think I can heal people? What's the problem? And so he tears his robes, which was a sign of distress and and anger in this case, because he's wondering, is this king trying to pick a fight with me? Elisha hears about that, and basically in verse 8, you can see it. He essentially says, why are you tearing your robes? Put your clothes back on. Put your clothes back on. Send them to me. Send him to me, and they'll see. They will see that there's a prophet in Israel. They'll see God for who he truly is. And so that sets up our story. That's what Naaman is doing in his life. And so really the question that we keep coming back to is how can I position myself? How can I position myself in a place of faith where God can do bold miracles in my life and through me? How can we position ourselves for miracles? Well, Naaman is a perfect example of, of that. He had to position himself even in some ways that he's not going to be very comfortable with so that God can do some miracles in his life around his life. He was about to have a perspective change. He was about to put on a new set of glasses. And you know, I believe that today, hear me, I believe that today somebody is leaving this place with a new set of glasses. I believe that today God's going to help you see something so much more clearly and so differently than you've been seeing it because he's going to do something on the inside of you just like he did in Naaman. Just like Naaman had to have a perspective change in his life, had the privilege of baptizing a great guy, police officer by the name of Brent Roddy. And I want you to see his story because I think you'll see in his story, we're going to look at his story for two straight weeks, and you're going to see today that he was forced, as Naaman somewhat was, to be in this position of need, a position where he had to look up, a position where his perspective started to shift. And so I want you to hear his story. Curtis is going to lead through the screen. He's going to interview him. And then we're going to sing this song called I Will. And as you do that, I want you to reflect in your own heart, in your own journey, how God may be positioning you for a perspective change in your own life. Check out his story. Good morning. We are in the middle of our series on bold faith and joining us this morning to talk about his incredible story is Brent Roddy. Brent, you've got quite the story. You grew up and it started off pretty benign. You were baptized as a child. You grew up in a family that went to church and read the Bible, but it really wasn't until high school that you truly connected with God. Tell us about that time. That's correct. So in in the fall of 1996, I was going to another church and the youth pastor at that church took an interest in me, but more importantly in my my walk with Jesus. And it was at that time that that I was saved. Fast forward a couple years, 2001, a big year for you. You get married, but you also join the Fort Wayne police force. Let's talk about your marriage, started well, didn't end so well. You were married for about 12 years, but uh, it did end in divorce. That's correct. Um, We just did not see eye to eye, and we decided that it was best that that we part ways at that point. At the same time, your career with the police is probably following a a similar path. It's starting very well, it's going well, but then six, seven years into it, things start to change. How how did they change? So in in about... uh, 2007, I became a detective, and I was very quickly uh, involved with the homicide team. And I was seeing a lot of things that people just aren't meant to see. The worst of the worst. Absolutely. And then you were actually attacked by a suspect. That's correct. 
Um, I was attacked at work and very lucky to come out alive from that situation. Um, I was also very quickly diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I began to drink at that time. Um, I had been drinking before that, but it became very uh, more involved at that point so that I could cope. What was the drinking like? Was it, was it a constant? Was it an every day? Were you using it to get through your daily life? Not necessarily to get through the day, but to end my day so that I could get to sleep. And then you hit rock bottom with the drinking. This is after your divorce um, and after that attack. Uh, in fact, just about a year ago, on Easter Sunday morning of 2016, you were involved in a terrible accident. I was. Set the stage there. What happened leading up to those early morning hours of Easter last year? I had uh, been out drinking with some friends and fortunately, uh, by, by God's hand, uh, that's the only way I can describe it, I got them dropped off. Um, but as I was on my way home, um, some of my symptoms uh, resurfaced and I basically put my foot to the floor and I was going about 100 miles an hour just prior to the accident. And what happened? Uh, didn't negotiate a curve, uh, went through a telephone pole and then uh, came to rest on a tree. I've seen the pictures, they're amazing. If anyone had been in any other spot of that car besides the driver's seat, it's hard to imagine they would have lived through that. Oh, that's absolutely correct. And again, it truly was the hand of God because the only part of that car that was left intact was the driver's seat. And you were injured, but you actually opened the door and got out of the car. I did because I thought the car was on fire, but again, it was not. But injured pretty badly, what injuries did you sustain there? I had a pretty uh, severe concussion. I had some broken ribs and more cuts and scratches than you could shake a stick at. So you end up in the hospital. What was that experience like? It was very eye-opening. Um, I, I did not want to live. I asked God to take me home, um, but he did not. He had other plans for me. So you were literally suicidal. You thought this was the end. Truly, I did. It's an incredible turnaround from where Brent was that morning, uh, Easter last year, to where he is today. And next week, we're gonna take you through part two of his unbelievable journey.
Like a father and a friend Aren't you glad we serve a God who says, I will? When you can't, he will. And a lot of times we look at this idea of putting ourselves in positions to encounter this I will God, and we'll, we'll often say that we believe he can carry the load, but then take the load back as though he can't. But I'm glad I serve a God that today looks at me and looks at you and says, I'll carry that load. When you're empty, when I call you to take steps that are uncomfortable, I'll carry you when you can't carry yourself. Some of you came today, and that's the message you needed to hear. Well, you got it, and I challenge you to grow in that. And I want to just go on and give you the bottom line now as we continue and build on that, because the thought is this, that if we're going to position ourselves for miracles through our bold faith, if we're going to sing, I will, serve a God who says I will, but then to that God, let his I will become our own I will. I will follow you. I will do whatever you ask of me, God. Then it's going to require a change in our perspective. And so the bottom line is this, and I've used this phrase with you before, but it just rings in my ears as I read this story. And the statement is simply this, how I see will determine how I be. How I see will determine how I be. In other words, our perspective and our faith and our obedience go hand in hand. How you see always leads to how you walk it out, how you move forward in your life. And so today, that's what we're going to look at. Somebody is leaving here with this place with a new perspective, with a new set of glasses, because we're going to look at two obedience-defining, two obedience-defining perspectives, perspective shifts, perhaps, that God wants to bring about in your life through this story. Who's ready for those this morning with the story of Naaman? Look there, we're going to go to verses 9 through 12. I used verses 1 through 8 to set up Naaman's story. But here's the first perspective shift, the per first perspective that we see in the story, and it's our me view. Everybody say me view. The me view, how I see me. Look at somebody and say, how do I look? Ask them. Now look back and say, you look fabulous. And here's the thing. I start with this for two reasons. This first part, this first perspective is here for two reasons. Number one, because it's straight out of the text. We see it in Naaman's life. It's straight out of this story, straight out of the Bible to you and to me. And by the way, we believe here at Blackhawk that it shouldn't be me that speaks to you. It shouldn't be your friend that speaks to you. It should be the Word of God because it is transcendent and it speaks directly to the heart of all of us. It doesn't matter if you don't know Jesus, if you've known Jesus all your life, the Word of God speaks to you right where you are. Have you ever noticed that? It's the beauty of the Bible. I love the Bible. Have you ever noticed that about me? If you didn't know, I want you to know that. I love the Bible because it just cuts straight to the heart of all of our issues. And so that's the first reason that we're going to start with me views because it's straight out of the Bible. The second reason is I believe, I truly believe when it comes to how I see, determining how I be, how I see the world around me, it really starts with how I see me. 
If you don't have a correct view of yourself, you'll never be able to love other people the way that God has intended for you to love them. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. You ever thought about that? Love your neighbor as yourself. He says love your neighbor, yes, but as yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself? Wow. Well, there's been seasons of my life that I didn't love me very much. When I looked in the mirror, I didn't like what stared back at me. But if you can't see yourself the way that God sees you, you won't really be able to build a capacity to see other people or to see your situations or your problems the way that God sees them. And so that's what we're going to see this turn into in Naaman's life. So let's look at the me view part of this, verses 9 through 12. Let's read that together. So this comes right after Elisha had heard that the king tore his robes and he said, put your clothes back on, just send them to me. Is basically what he says there. There is a prophet of Israel and there is a God. And so that's where we're at there in verse number nine. If you've got your apps, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version if you want to follow along. Same version that's in your seats and you can take that Bible home if you don't have one. Verse nine. So Naaman came, Captain Awesome, right? So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, we're going to come back to that, that's interesting, saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman, verse 11, was angry and went away saying, behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. My way, my way. Yeah, we're coming back to that. There's a lot there. Verse 12. Are not, he keeps going as if he stops there. He says, are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? That water's nasty, you guys. I don't want to wash in the Jordan. I want to wash in the best rivers. After all, I'm Captain Awesome. Hmm. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. I call that a Bible hissy fit. He stomped off. You ever had kids stomp off before in a rage? They pitched a fit. You ever pitched a fit? Mm -hmm. Spiritually, I think we do that all too often. But look at verse 15 for a minute. We're not going to actually read that as a part of these points, but I want you to see how the story ends. So I want to jump to the end, and then I'll come right back to where we are. Verse 15, after he's healed, because spoiler alert, he does get healed eventually. We'll see how he gets healed is the question, though. Verse 15 says he returned to the man of God, to Elisha and all of his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said... Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. What does he mean by that? It means I found the one true God. I found him. Some of you here are going to have the same ending to your story. I truly believe that today you're going to find the one true God in your life as Naaman did. But he says, I see me different because I see God different. And you know, Naaman, he came to this equation with exceptions. You ever had exceptions? You say things like, I'll forgive anything, God, except for that one offense. Except. God, I'll love everybody except that one person because you don't know what they did to me. I'll go anywhere, God, anywhere. I will follow you wherever you lead except that place. A lot of times we fit that. Naaman had those same exceptions, and Naaman was saying that if the key is dipping, I know some really good rivers. God, if, if, you, if it's just about the water, I know of even some better water. So God, let me take your plan that, you know, it's, you know, it's all right. It's a good plan. But let me take your plan and make it better. Let me take your plan, God, and make it my plan. I know there are seasons in my life where I've done that too many times. And that's where Naaman is. But I think what happened is Naaman had become too good for his own good. Shame on us if we get there and we think we're too good and it's too good for our own good where we don't realize how good our good, good father truly is. But we can do that because it's natural. And I believe the key to freedom from that, a freedom in how we view ourselves, really comes back to infusing obedience, marrying our obedience to those areas of our life. You ready for this? This is going to hurt. Brace yourself. Tying our obedience, infusing our obedience to the areas of our life where we are found resisting God the most. I think that's the key to this me view that God has for you, for me, and that we see shifting in the life of Naaman. Jesus, to me, is the ultimate Naaman 
mindset antidote. Jesus in Philippians 2, you can just jot that down. We did a whole series on Philippians called Inside Out. If you weren't here with us for that, we talked all about Philippians 2 and how Jesus emptied himself, how Jesus took on the form of a slave, it says in Philippians 2. He made himself nothing, took on the form of a slave so that he could fulfill that which he said he would fulfill. And he said, I have not come to be served, but to serve. He says to his disciples, if you want to be the greatest if you want to be first, you've got to make yourself last. Jesus took on the opposite mindset, and Naaman's getting introduced to that mindset. And I want to help you fill in some blanks if you're taking notes. I believe this statement is so true, not just in this story, but in your life and in mine. I believe the lower you get, the lower you get, the higher God can take you. The lower you get, the higher God can take you. I'm not talking about low circumstances. Maybe. God can certainly use those too. I'm talking about the me view part of that. The more realistic, it doesn't mean you beat yourself up. It actually has the opposite effect. We're going to see how that kind of turns. You ever notice that God does things in a very irrational, illogical way? I'm a believer that God's everything illogical. He defies the logic of normal people just like you and me because he's God and I'm not. But the lower I get, the lower I view me and I start to see how much I need him, the more, the higher God can do and take me on this path. And so we see that Jesus did that. And a lot of times God often asks us to take these decisive steps of obedience, especially the ones that don't make sense, if it's like my life, to do a couple of things, to reveal areas of pride and then to necessitate a response to those areas, to reveal how maybe I'm viewing me a little too highly so that I can then respond to that truth. And so I want to ask you a question. I want, I want you to do some honest reflection. What is the Jordan River in your life today? The Jordan River for Naaman was that nasty river. Nasty. I'm not going to that one. God, if it's about dipping, if I can be healed by dipping in a river, I'll go to the better rivers. I, can, I even name some. I know what they are. So what's the Jordan River in your life, that thing that God has led you towards or is speaking to you about, yet you don't want to really put yourself in a position to need the miracle that you're really asking him for in that area to begin with? Is it the person that you won't forgive? Is it the human achievement that you're struggling just to defer and put aside so that you can truly pursue God's plan? Is it the refusal to just stay where God has you and bloom where God has planted you? Is it the decision to leave where God has planted you and go to a new place that he has revealed to you? It could be either or. Is it a secret sin that you need to confess? One that you've been holding on to all of your life just for you, but it's time to bring somebody in and live in community. That's why we say that over and over and over and confess and say, I need some help, I need some accountability, I need people to hold me up when I feel weak. God will hold you up, but he uses other people as his arms and his feet and his hands and his legs. That's why it's important to be attached to a local church. Is it an embarrassing conversation that you need to have, a phone call that it's time to make? I don't know, but what's the Jordan River in your life? I believe we all have one at different seasons in our life, and what I'll tell you is this. There's an even greater messenger, an even greater messenger than Elisha, this man of God, who wants to say something to you right now. He's even greater than Elisha. It's the Holy Spirit. And he's already working inside of you, and he's got a message for you. You ready for it? Take a dip. Take a dip in your Jordan River. The thing that you've been pushing against, it's time to take a step towards. It's time to take a dip, as Naaman was challenged to do in his own life. It's time for us to take those steps, to take a dip, to plunge into those rivers that we have tried to avoid. And, you know, I was thinking about what my Jordan River was a lot, and you've heard some of my story. Uh, even coming here to Indiana was not a part of the plans that Jessica and I had made for ourselves. It was really not anything that was on our map. But you know what I've learned? The end of the story, like I gave you with Naaman, is that God's plans are always better than my plans, <laughs> And I'm seeing that every week because it's so clear and so affirmed that God brought us together for this season, not because I'm great or because you need me, but because we all need him. And he's got us together for this season so that he can have his way and his agenda can be reached for us. But to get there, that sounds good. You should say amen about that. Like, yeah, some good, that's some good preaching. That'll preach. But now, now I'm going to back up. 
and give you the honest picture of how we got there. God had to reveal some pride-centered idols in my life and in Jessica's. If I were to have been asked in that season of my life when God had been stirring, you may have heard me talk about Isaiah 43, 18, and 19. It was a repetitive theme in my life and in my wife Jessica's that, behold, I'm going to do something new in your life. Will you not perceive it? Will you not own it? Will you not embrace it? And so we felt this stirring. Just be ready to be uncomfortable. We're in the process of adopting. And so we thought, well, maybe it's adoption. That's enough of a stretching. Can I get an amen, those of you who have done it? But God had more, and he kept stretching, and he kept stirring, and eventually he revealed that there was an idol in our life. And that idol was the comfort and the security of living in the place that we had always known, the place we had grown up in in Georgia, at the church I had been at, felt very comfortable being at, around all of our family, all of our friends, and that comfort and security that came from that had become something that I depended on more than God. It's a big lesson that I had to learn. And God used you. It's your fault. <laughs> God used you. God used this place, this call in our life to stretch us beyond our means and put ourselves in a position to see him do miracles and overcome the things that we clung to when we became open-handed. God's done amazing things. Why do I share all this? Like, good job. No, I'm kind of embarrassed to share some of those things. Because I should have been like, Let's burn those cows and plows and go. But I had to work through some things, and God wants you to work through some things today to bring you to places you never dreamed possible. Am I talking about a physical place that's different from here? I don't know. Maybe. It may be here. It may be in that work relationship that you have. It may be in that current relationship that God has you in for this season. I don't know what God's telling you, but I know he wants to do great miracles through you when you overcome the rivers, the Jordan rivers in your life. One of the things that I learned, John 3 and verse 30 says, he must increase and I must decrease. He must increase and I must decrease. For that to happen, the me view, this is, you want a me view game changer? You ready for it? This is maybe not what you expected. This is where it turns the tide. You know, it's all been about where we see ourselves in a lower way, but let me build it up for a minute because if you know Jesus, please look at me, hear me when I say this. Some of you have had people tear you down all of your life. If you know Jesus today, you know what he sees when he looks at you? You said, yeah, all the mess, all the skeletons in my closet, all the sin, all the dirt, all the grime, all the terrible stuff in my life. He saw all that. Doesn't surprise him, but that's not what he sees. If you know Jesus, do you know what he sees? He sees Jesus. He sees the cleansing power and the blood and the salvation and the hope and the purpose and the ownership as one of his children because of Jesus. When he looks at you, he sees through the mess to the heart of who you have now become because of Jesus Christ. That'll change your me view. And here's what I'll tell you. A lot of times we get so caught up in do, do, do for God. Do this and do that. And do. We're, a lot of times the church becomes known. It drives me crazy sometimes. That we become known for this do's and don'ts place where it's all about the rules and the legalism and those things. I've been caught up in that. I've grown up in some of those things. I get it. But what I have learned is that when I understand who I am in Jesus, it changes everything about how I do things in my life. How I see determines how I be. And here's the statement. It's a game changer for your me view, and it's this, what you do for God will never be as important as who you are to God. What you do for God will never be as important as who you are to God. When you see that, how you do things in your life, that's when the church will shift from not being known for what we're against. A lot of times the church becomes known for what we're against. I believe that the church should be known for what we're for and who we represent. And all those things take care of themselves. We stand on truth. We follow Jesus. We are for the love and the grace that he gives out in this world. When we do that, it changes everything about how the church is perceived. I think it starts to look a little bit more like Jesus. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. That's why when we look around, I see different skin colors. I see different sizes. I see different shapes. I see different backgrounds. I see people in suits and ties. I see people in T-shirts and shorts. And I love it because I think God loves it because it represents the diverse picture of what heaven looks like. We should practice today for what heaven's going to look like one day when we're all together, like it or not. That'll change your me view. Let's go to number two. Your me view. Now, let's talk about the re-view. 
There's a me view in the story, but there's a re view in the story. Look at verses 13 and 14. It's where we see this re view, where he goes back and looks again, decides to, I'm going to review this thing that I walked away with my hissy fit away from. Look at verse 13. So this is after he walked away in a rage. But his servants came near to him and said, you dummy. That's what I would, <laughs> that's what I would have said. That's in the NKV, the new Kevin version. <laughs> don't buy that Bible. You don't want that one. <laughs> but it's verse 13. But his servants came near and said to him, my father, it's a great word. The prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? You don't hear you dummy in that? He has actually said to you, wash and be clean. In other words, isn't that what you came here for? Have you forgotten the mission that you had when you got here? Verse 14, so he reviewed. He decided, I'm going to look at it a different way. I'm going to look again. He went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, the one he didn't want to go to, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Sometimes we've got to go back and review how I see me, but how I see the world around me as well. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. That's what we see happening here. And I'll tell you, greater opportunities later in your life are almost always going to require immediate, immediate obedience now. Greater opportunities later are always going to require immediate obedience now. A lot of times those are going to be uncomfortable steps. Don't you think Naaman was glad he went back and looked again at the situation? He had turned and stomped off in a fit of rage, but he decided, let's look again. Don't you think he was glad that he went back and looked again? Do you know that today in your life, some of the greatest miracles, the greatest things God's going to do in your life are going to come from the times when you had almost given up on something, but you decided, I'm going to go back one more time and look again. That marriage that you were this close to quitting on, if you just go back and look again to see how God could be working, that situation that's driving you crazy at work, you just go back and you look at it one more time and say, God, how are you working there? Or that step that he's called you to take to step out of your comfort zone, moving away or to join a ministry group or to volunteer at Blackhawk or somewhere else in the community, you decided you're not going to do it because it's not the right season, even though you know God was stirring you to take that uncomfortable step, but you go back and look again to see what God's doing. Sometimes the best things God will ever do will be from those seasons where you just go back and take one more look, review the situation one more time looking for God, and he'll speak up and step up in ways you would never dream possible. But I want you to know today that seeking, seeking God's perspective requires persistence. Sometimes to look again, like Naaman did, it requires you being persistent. A lot of times we think that God gives his presence to us in our life so that it'll fix our problems. You ever had that kind of faith? Well, I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to hear from God because he's going to fix my problems. And I want you to know today I could make this church shout if I preached hard and loud that, hey, all those problems you brought in today, if you follow after Jesus, they're all going to go away. Everybody would cheer and scream and clap, but here's what's going to happen. You're going to get back home, and you didn't put anything in the crock pot. You're still not going to have a feast. You didn't clean up your house. The angels didn't swoop in because pastor said that. And, and you walk into a beautiful, clean picture. The mess that often is your life is still going to be pretty messy. Sometimes it might even get messier. Mm. I don't like that sometimes about faith, but sometimes it does. It gets you into a season where you've got to look up more to God than maybe you ever have before. I believe some of you are in that situation. The only place you have to look is up. But today, God wants, as you look up to him, you to be persistent, to keep looking at and through the situation to find him, to find Jesus in the midst of it. And I promise you, as you look for him, you will find him. I want to give you a statement that's going to challenge you this week. I believe that when you look at the Bible, when it comes to faith, bold faith, the opposite of faith is sight, not doubt. The opposite of faith is sight, not doubt. That means that the opposite of faith is not, God, I'm trying to follow you, but I have questions sometimes. Can I tell you something? God is big enough to handle your questions. A lot of times I've had pastors say to me, don't you dare question God. 
You're already doing it anyway, and he already knows what you're thinking, so you might as well say it to him because he already knows you're thinking it. Can I just be real today? <laughs> he already knows where you're at. He can handle your questions. Yet, is it true that the more your faith grows, the bigger your faith gets, the less you'll question God? Yeah, I think so. But sometimes to get to that bold faith spot, we got to ask some questions. God's big enough to handle your questions. And I believe that that's why in Scripture it's very clear that the opposite of faith is sight and not doubt. It says that we walk by faith and not by what? We walk by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 11.1 1 says faith is the evidence of the things that we hope for, the things that are not yet seen. That's the opposite. Faith is me taking steps forward even when I don't see totally where I'm going. If I could see where I'm going and I saw the end of the equation, I wouldn't need faith to begin with. But that's what God does through us and in us. And I want you to know today, if you walk by faith, if you walk by faith and not by sight, then you're often going to hear something from God before God gives you any evidence of the thing that he had told you about. He's going to say, I'm going to make a change in your life. I'm going to do something miraculous. I'm going to stretch, and I'm going to grow you, but I'm not going to show you how yet. He starts to stir inside of you, and he doesn't give you the end of the picture right at the beginning of the journey. Why? I'm convinced it's because I can't handle the end picture at the beginning of the journey. Most of the time, this journey with me, if I'd have seen the end game, I'd have probably run like Jonah in that season of my life, but God wanted to build and show me things and teach me along the way, and he's doing the same thing in your life. Will you not perceive it? Will you not embrace it? Will you not grab hold and allow him to continue working through faith and not by sight? I want to challenge you today. Look again. Look again. Look again. Don't quit. Look again. God's there. Jesus is working. Will you not allow him to do that? I think a lot of times the reason that God will often tell us he wants to make a change before he gives any evidence of that change is that he doesn't want us to put our faith in the change itself, but instead to put our faith in his promises until we get to the change. Think on that this week. What is God doing, revealing to you, stirring inside of you? Sometimes to see a change, sometimes to see a change, you've got to stare through your circumstance. If you want to see a change in your life, you're oftentimes going to have to stare a hole through that circumstance because it's going to look foggy and it's going to look confusing. But as you do that, God's going to reveal some things to you, ways that he's at work in your life that maybe you didn't notice the first time. It's time to review your circumstance. But it starts with this me view of knowing how much I need Jesus and that even when it comes to my obedience, it's not so much about everything I can do for God. Have you ever stacked up those cards, by the way? <laughs> If you don't believe me in that statement, it's not about what I do for God. It's more about what, who I am to God, and that leads to the stuff I can do for God. Stack up what you're actually able to do for God. Make a list. Go ahead. You already made one, didn't you? <laughs> I don't have a lot to bring to the table, but when you meet Jesus, hear me. When you meet Jesus, you have everything that pertains to life and godliness. When you meet Jesus, that stack, that list that you said, well, there isn't one. I don't have anything I can do for God becomes this endless picture of potential in your life, this endless faith that those little mustard seeds, if you weren't here last week, go back on our website and watch that when we talked about mustard seeds. And I said, they're not seeds, they're trees. The endless faith that comes from a tiny little seed turns into a tree because of Jesus in your life. When you see this me view that I don't have anything to bring to the table, but you review your life enough to see how much you need Jesus, Jesus enters the picture and he changes everything about your faith and your life. You have all that you need to take those bold steps of faith that God is calling you to take, those things that he's stirring, and with the faith just the size of a mustard seed, your whole eternity can shift and change forever. Verse 14, I want to tell you one last thing about this, and I want to ask you just to reflect and make some decisions today. Verse 14, it says that his skin became like that of, some versions say, a boy, or in ESV it says a child. You know the actual word for that? Could be translated servant. Hmm. Could be translated servant. His skin became like that of a servant. Interesting. Because I think that his skin was transformed. Yeah, it was. But I think more than his skin being transformed, his heart was transformed. Naaman's dip in the Jordan River became a doorway 
for his eternity, for his destiny, for his life, for his faith. And when Naaman finally lowers, think about this picture of Jesus. Jesus is in every book of the Bible, if you didn't know that. Prove me wrong, I dare you. He's the theme of all of it. That when Naaman lowers himself into the Jordan River, there's significance with the numbers and all, but I just want to stay more basic than that and help you think that when he lowered himself into the river, he lowered himself, his view of himself, and he reviewed his life, and he came up and he saw it from a whole different perspective. His glasses had forever changed. He lowered himself in humility, and he came up a new man. That's a picture of what Jesus does for us. I like the picture of baptism that's there as well. Why do we do baptism? We do baptism because it symbolizes the death and burial of Jesus, him paying that price for you that you could never pay as we go under the water. And his resurrection, the fact that he's alive as you come out of the water and you come up a new person, that stuff up there is just water, but it represents living water. It represents eternal life. It represents what only Jesus can do in you and through you. Naaman found that humility. He saw himself differently. He saw his circumstances differently. And then now how he saw will now determine how he walks out his life. I think that's what God wants of us. I want to ask you just to close your eyes with me for a moment. Some of you are here and you know Jesus. And God's laid a big step of faith on your heart today. I want to challenge you just to pray for those that are trying to find out what faith means for them. Trying to find out if they can truly be saved by meeting Jesus the way that we're looking at today. Pray for those people and pray for God to just continue working and stretching and growing you. What's that Jordan River? Take a dip. You can hit your knees where you sit. You can get up and leave and make that phone call, whatever that needs to look like. I challenge you, don't wait. You're not gonna disrupt anything. But I wanna speak to those of you who may not know Jesus today. If that's you, today is the day of salvation for you. I believe that, why? Because I'm so good, I can save you? No, just because I know the one who is that good. And his name is Jesus. You've been putting it off, perhaps. You've been saying, when I get this straightened out and when I figure out how to get this part of my life in order, then I'll take that step. Until then, I'm not really good enough. And I want to challenge you to know today that you'll never be good enough for salvation. That's kind of the point, is that we can't save ourselves. We all fall short of God's glory. But Jesus lived the sinless life that you and I could never live. Why? so that he could pay that price, that debt, like that widow we looked at last week, the debt she couldn't pay, the sin debt that you could never pay, Jesus already paid it. It's already won, it's already finished, it's already through. You're not fighting for that victory, that victory's been won. Salvation is about acknowledging that, believing that, but then saying to Jesus, Jesus, I'm yours. I give you me, all of me, every piece. I've been trying to save myself. I've been basing my life all around me. But from this day forward, even though I'm going to make mistake after mistake from this day forward, my life is yours. I give you me. Take me, all of me. Trust him. I'm not going to lead you in a time of prayer. I'm just going to give you a time of prayer, just a moment to reflect. Because I believe in your heart today. You're taking that step. Your heart is screaming it out to Jesus. Salvation comes from that condition of your heart, not about the words of your mouth. Will you take a moment and cry out to Jesus and ask him to save you today? If that's you, would you take a moment and do it now?